namo bhagavate vasudevaya This morning we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 2 entitled Hiranyakashipu, King of the Demons, Text 47. Srila Prabhupada begins his purport. The living entity is bound by the subtle body consisting of the mind, intelligence, and false ego. In today's translation we find Shukadev Goswami quoting Hiranyakashipu. Because of this covering, the soul is connected with material energy and must accordingly suffer material conditions and reversals continually, life after life. In other words, it is not an option. Dukalayam Ashashvatam Abramabhubanaloka punar avatunorjana mamupeti dukontaya punar janmana vidyate This material existence from its highest point of Brahmaloka to its lowest Patala Loka. They are places of suffering. They are places where, where birth, old age, disease, and death are inevitable. That cannot be changed. Human society has struggled since time immemorial to create some material solutions to these problems. But it's like trying to be in the ocean and not be wet. You have to get out of the ocean if you want to not be wet. Suffer material conditions and reversals. Whoever we may be. Hiranyakashipu just after this verse, he's a good graphic to see example. So powerful with such mystic cities. Will, will I see you? Are you in town? Thank you very much. Arivo. The position of Hiranyakashipu. He defeated Indra. He had no opposition. All of his enemies were acting as his obedient servants. Even the great Brahmins and sages who can put curses on you were bowing down at his feet. If he wanted the sun to shine at night, he just ordered Vivaswan shine. Vivaswan counteracted all the laws of nature just for Hiranyakashipu. If he wanted rain, Indra, rain. Yes, sir. Yes, master. Rain? 
That was his power. And what was his wealth? He had conquered the heavens. And what was his prestige? Just by his moving his eyebrow, even the greatest demigods and warriors sh shook with fear. Very significant. But yet, reversals. <laughs> Whatever you do, something's going to be there to create misery. His own son, his favorite son, becomes a devotee. That was too much. And actually, his son loved him more than anyone else in the world. People feared him, but nobody loved him. By power, by prestige, you may gain fear from people or external respect, but inside they're usually envious. But you cannot get love, not real love. Prahlad loved Hiranyakashipu more than Hiranyaksha, <laughs> who, who was roaming through the universe to conquer for his brother, more than Hiranyakashipu's own wife, who had a amorous relationship with him. <clears throat> Prahlad, Prahlad actually loved him. If it wasn't for that love, he would not have taken the risk to speak so boldly in his presence. But Hiranyakashipu, blinded by his false ego, could not understand that love. And he took it as a great threat. Historically, in terms of religion, we find this continuously that those who truly love are seen as threats and enemies to people who are, whose intelligence is distorted by the false ego. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's the Lord. He loved everyone. Yes. And yet those Brahmin, those young Brahmins, they were blaspheming him. They were threatening to do physical harm to him. And he loved them so much, he gave up his wife, his mother, his wonderful home in Navadweep, took sannyas just to reach the people who were blaspheming him. Just to reach the people who were rejecting his love. Haridas Thakur, why is he the Namacharya? Not only because he was chanting 300,000 names a day, because other people somehow or other may be able to chant 300,000 names a day. But it was his character that made him the Namacharya. He was so humble, he was so tolerant, he offered all respect to others and he didn't care anything about being respected himself. He was not only chanting, he was preaching the glories of the Holy Name because he loved everyone. He didn't care whether one was a Hindu or a Muslim or an atheist or a Jain or a Parsi or a, or a 
Christian, he didn't care any of these things. He loved the soul because he loved Krishna and he wanted to give everyone that love. Man, Hindu Brahmins hated him. Muslim Qazis hated him. Agnostics and atheists hated him. They threatened him. They blasphemed him. They sentenced him to death. They tortured him. And the whole while, he loved them. Spiritual love is unconditional. Not only for God, but for every living being. Because every living being is part and parcel of God. If you have unconditional, unmotivated love for Krishna, that will extend toward everyone. And he was willing to make such sacrifices to show that love. Therefore, Haridas Thakur is sometimes compared to an incarnation of Prahlad. Vasudev Dutt, when he prayed, let all living beings go back to Godhead. Let me take all their karma. Perpetually suffer hellish conditions. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, this is not a surprise you're speaking like this, because you are Prahlad Maharaj. What does that mean? That means he loves everyone. But from Hiranyakashipu's perspective, and from the perspective of two people too much infatuated by their materialistic ways, anyone who preaches the truth becomes a threat, an enemy. Bhagavad Gita says the quality of a devotee is the devotee has no enemies. But it seems a contradiction, because devotees always have enemies. So why Krishna says he has no enemies? That means in his heart there's no enemies. Krishna's telling Arjuna a devotee has no enemy. And at the same time, he's on the battlefield saying, these are your enemies, kill them. That's why we need purports. <laughs> and Srimad Bhagavatam says the only enemy for anyone is their own mind. And this was exactly what Prahlad Maharaj hated more than anything else. This distinction between friends and enemies. Yes? Of all the things in the school that he challenged, Sanda and Amarka, the seminal sons of Shukracharya, this is what he really didn't like. He could have complained about so many technicalities about education and different cultural, social um, lessons he was learning. But he said, I cannot tolerate this idea that you're teaching that this is your friend and this is your enemy, and how to deal with your friend and how to deal with your enemy, how to conquer and exploit your enemy, <clears throat> and how to somehow or other keep your friend and you know, utilize him or her according to your needs and your wants. I cannot think like this. For me, there's only Krishna and Krishna's children. Everyone is my friend. The only enemy is the mind that distorts our ability to see Krishna everywhere and in everything. So yes, Krishna is telling Arjuna, you must kill. You must fight. Now, fighting on a battlefield means you have to distinguish between friends and enemies. But he's doing it in the spirit of a surgeon, not in the spirit of a uh, selfishly motivated 
person. <clears throat> a surgeon loves the patient, but hates the disease. The disease is the enemy, not the person. Just like if you have malaria. The doctor, you can die if you're not treated real fast. Yes? Aggressive. So the doctor gives medicine to kill that disease. It's an enemy. You can't be sentimental about such enemies. You have to kill it. You have to attack it. But it's with compassion. <clears throat> One of my very dearest God brothers recently had cancer. They opened up his liver to see what was inside and they saw this horrible tumor. And they said, you know, we have to take it out. But then they couldn't take it out. <laughs> so they said, you have, we have to take out your whole liver, otherwise you're going to die real soon. You have to get a liver transplant. That means that tumor is an enemy. So in Bhagavad Gita, what was the enemy Arjuna was fighting? Avidya. Ignorance. Ignorance of Duryodhana in his people. The ignorance of his... That, that he's not this body, but he's the spirit soul. Now please know, Duryodhana, <clears throat> similar to Hiranyakashipu, was not just, you know, some ignorant person of philosophy. He knew philosophy. He went to the school, same school as Yudhisthira and Arjuna, the school of Dronacharya. He was teaching him to fight with weapons, but Drona is also a Brahmin. You know he's going to teach them Vedas as well. Yes? It wasn't only, you know, shoot this. He was giving purports to the lessons. And Bhishma, the great Mahajan, he was equally teaching philosophy, culture, morality to the Pandavas and the Kurus. Duryodhana got the same education as Arjuna. But he was envious. He was ignorant. He was only thinking in terms of Janasya Mahoya Mahamameti, I and mine. And like Hiranyakashipu, could twist the philosophy in such ways to suit their own purposes. It's very dangerous. A person who doesn't know is not as dangerous as a person who knows but exploits it. So, we find here, <clears throat> Arjuna is telling, I mean, Krishna is telling Arjuna, you must kill the enemy of ignorance and deliver these souls, liberate them all for their own benefit. Kurukshetra was like an operation theater. Yes, to love means to attract enemies. <laughs> if you're sentimental, you'll still have enemies. Whatever you do in this world, you will have enemies. And reversals and sufferings. Because it is how material nature has been created. And the root cause of this suffering is being explained here is because we forget our relationship with God 
we are bound by this subtle body of mind, intelligence, and false ego. Liberation means to be liberated from the subtle body. As long as we have attachment to this subtle body, we must suffer repeated birth and death. Now, you cannot see the subtle body with your gross senses. Just like you cannot see the wind. Our Acharya has given an analogy that just like a fragrance is carried by the wind from one place to another, <clears throat> yes, it could be a good fragrance, could be a miserable fragrance. You don't see it, but you, you, can, you can smell it. How is it coming? Yes? The wind carries it. In the same way, the subtle body carries the soul from one birth to another. The Padma Purana describes there are 8,400,000 species of life. Why have they been created? That's the most important thing. We can study through science and biology, you know, what are the four thought, what, what are the different species of life, how they're living, how they're existing, how they're mating, how they're defending. But the most important question is why are they there? <clears throat> and there's only one person who knows why they're there. Creator, who made them. He has a reason for everything. Everything has a deep, profound reason. The reason there is to facilitate the karma of the soul. Now, Srila Prabhupada he explains that this is evolution. When the soul enters into the lower species of life, by the natural process of evolution, it raises from one species to the next, to the next, to the next, until ultimately it comes to the human birth. And then it has the free will to decide its own future destiny. The lower species cannot decide anything. They're just going in a natural order. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada says that Charles Darwin stole the theory of evolution from the Padma Purana. Now this is very interesting. He was from the British area, yes, Charles Darwin. He was from British area. And during the time of his life, <coughs> India was under British rule. And so many of the educated people were exploring the different teachings of the Vedas, yes. So he stole this concept of evolution from Padma Purana. But, Prabhupada said, he distorted it with his own mental speculation. And because his knowledge has such power, when you distort that knowledge, it still has so much power. Just like Hiranyakashipu, he's speaking Vedic knowledge, but because he distorts it, what he's speaking has great power. All of these demons we read about in the, in the Puranas, they're not just people who, you know, go to the gym and get, you know, strong. <laughs> they're people who, because, because they know the Vedas, they understand how to perform tapasya, what yajnas they're supposed to perform, 
what charities they're supposed to perform, and how to access powers from demigods. They're mystic yogis. And we find all of these, Hiranyakashipu, Ravana, Kumbhakarna, all these people, study the tapasyas they performed. Part of their tapasya was total morality, total mind control, total sense control, celibacy. All these things were there. That's how they got their powers. But then once they get their powers, then uh, enough with all of that tapasya. But they would be fasting. They would be giving charity to Brahmins. They would be doing everything right when they were performing their tapasya. They weren't engaging in illicit sex, intoxication, gambling, or meat eating. They gave up intoxication, eating, meat eating, gambling, illicit, all these things. They were living very pure, moral lives. They were giving charity. And they were doing just exactly the proper sacrifices or yajyas to please the demigods. They knew the, they knew the science because they knew the Vedas. And therefore they were getting mystical powers. Ravana was given benediction. You can change into any form you like. And no one no one except ordinary human beings can kill you. Because he considered it to be like admission of weakness to ask for the benediction that human beings can't kill me. It's like if you approached Brahma and prayed, please bless me that ant, ants can't kill me. People would say, what's well, a nonsense person? He's afraid of ants? What's it's, it's against his prestige? So his own prestige is what killed him. Yes? He had too much prestige to, to, to even ask for the benediction of a human killing him. So a human killed him. Ram appeared like a human. Hiranyakashipu. So many benedictions he gained. Such powers. Because they take knowledge, Vedic knowledge, the highest, most powerful of all forms of knowledge, and they distort it. Very, very dangerous. Srila Prabhupada more than he attacked materialistic people, he attacked people who distorted Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada would quote that Krishna says that Arjuna, you can understand this teaching because you are my friend and you are my devotee. So Bhagavad Gita is for friends and devotees. Prabhupada said, if you want to give your own commentary, then write your own book. No problem, just write your own book. But don't distort Krishna's teachings. If you're not a friend and a devotee of Krishna, Prabhupada said, do not poke your nose in somebody else's business. <laughs> and how people can get millions and millions and millions of followers. because they're quoting the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, the power of Bhagavad Gita. Srimad Bhagavatam, such power. Even if a, if a Mayavadi gives a Bhagavad Saptaha, if he really has nice intelligence and good charisma, he can get tens and thousands of people coming. It's the power of the Bhagavatam. But if he's distorting it, very dangerous. So scientists like Darwin, t 
taking some taking a philosophy that's very very powerful but taking the soul out of it which is the whole purpose of it the transmigration of the soul and take the soul out and it makes people what's supposed to make people understand why they should live in harmony with the laws of God take the soul out and people became atheists they reject the concept of God as being unscientific sentimental it's very dangerous herein we find that <clears throat> the subtle body is our state of consciousness the false ego makes us identify with matter the mind accepts and the, the mind is just attracted and averse to all sorts of you know, gross and subtle sensual experience. And the tel intelligence tries to discriminate. So when the intelligence is under the influence of the mind, which is under the influence of the senses, that is the cause of all suffering. That is the cause of all the complications within the whole cosmic manifestation. Therefore, Krishna tells in, yoga, in Bhagavad Gita that there is no question of yoga without controlling the mind and senses. Yoga means the control of mind and senses. Now, today yoga is very, very popular all over the world. But the concept of yoga is to do some asanas, to do some pranayam, to get a clearer, intel clearer intellect and healthier, prettier body. But what they do not understand is before asana and pranayam are even followed in the proper yoga system, initially and simultaneously must be yama and niyama. And what is yama and niyama? It's controlling the mind. It's rules and regulations to develop your self-control and develop your character. Yes? Cleanliness, celibacy, following rules and regulations. That's the basis. Otherwise, if you're just doing yama, or if you're just you know, performing yogic postures and doing pranayama, you may feel good and everything, but it's not really yoga. The actual system of yoga is to control the mind and to transform your lifestyle and your character. What is it that differentiates a human being from an animal? The willingness to control your mind and senses. That's all. Srila Prabhupada says, if you take food and you just put it out, an animal, if it's hungry, it's just going to go for that food. Yes? Now, what makes a, a human being is supposed to be invited. <laughs> it's like if you're walking down the street with some food, you know, an animal might just come and take it out of your hand. But a human being will, will not do that. Similarly, sex life. For animals, they just do it. Nobody, there's not, there's not really concern for control, but a human being, according to certain 
principles must control their mind and senses. Now, certain domestic animals can be trained to restrain themselves out of fear. Yes? Wild animals, they don't control. They just... If a, if a tiger is hungry and he sees you, he doesn't ask your permission. He just immediately jumps and eats you. Domestic animals can be trained to restrain, right? It's like, you know, you just... You beat them a few times so they know they can't do this. They still want to do it, but they are afraid to do it. But a human being who's not willing to control their own mind and senses is not only an animal, it's a wild animal. <laughs> not even on the level of a domesticated animal. So it is this controlling of the mind that is the basis of spiritual life. It's the foundation of yoga. And Krishna tells here that, <clears throat> I mean, Prabhupada tells here, at the time of death, whatever the position of the mind is, that becomes the cause of your next body. Yam yam vapismaran bhavam tajatyante kalevaram. So all the 8,400,000 species of life, they're all existing, and the soul is in that particular body due to a particular thought that was at the time of death. Human being is transported according to that thought. And then gradually it evolves up, up, up. Thus, Srimad Bhagavatam tells, the only real enemy is one's own mind. And it is explained that just as a hunter who catches a very deadly wild animal must be very vigilant to guard that animal. Because the animal, by its nature, wants to escape and kill the hunter. Yes? Like, I heard recently there was news that there was a tiger in some American zoo and it escaped and ate somebody. Actually escaped and just went, just charged into the zoo and everyone was, all the little kids are eating their ice cream. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's a very serious thing. You know, that was... The parents are saying, this is a monkey, and this is a tiger. And they're all oh, eating cotton candies and ice cream and nice, you know, summer, not a summer day, well, wherever it was. And all of a sudden, rah, this tiger just jumped out of its, its area and just killed somebody. Hare Krishna. It's very big news all over the world about this. And now they're trying to find out who was at fault, why the tiger got out. And essentially the problem was they didn't take proper vigilance to keep that tiger in its place. Yes? And therefore, disaster, death. And actually, the zoo is just getting unbelievable um, bad press all over the world. Its reputation is very much destroyed. 
who's going to want to go to that zoo and bring their children to eat cotton candy and <laughs> when, when a tiger can get out? <clears throat> so just like a zookeeper must be very vigilant to keep the tigers in the cages, or a hunter must be very vigilant to keep the tiger <laughs> in captivity, knowing that that tiger is always looking for any slight opportunity to escape and cause havoc. That animal is our mind. The mind is always looking for some way to escape the control of the intelligence and cause havoc. So one who is on the spiritual path <clears throat> must always be on guard of the mind. But we won't be on guard of the mind unless we understand its nature. It wants to kill our spiritual inclinations. And it will either do it quickly or gradually, whatever works. Yes? It's like a prisoner in a prison. Sometimes a prisoner <clears throat> if the guards of the prison are not very alert, they'll just all of a sudden, you know, attack and run out. And then they're gone. Very quick, abrupt. But if the guards are more alert, there are, instant, there are histories where just little by little, over years, they'll somehow or other just start digging a little hole in the wall or something and they'll be digging little tunnels, little tunnels, little tunnels. If, it may take five years to make that tunnel so it can actually get outside, but it, it's happened. It's little by little, day by day, just, you know, maybe a few inches every day. They're just getting closer outside that wall. A few inches, a few inches, a few inches, and ultimately, after maybe Ten years, there's instances of just digging those little tunnels. Ten years later, they're out. And what do they do when they're out? They do criminal activities. <laughs> so the mind is like that. Either little by little, it's going to try to just somehow or other, just by getting you to deviate today and a little more tomorrow and a little more tomorrow and a little more tomorrow. The mind wants out of this Krishna consciousness. It wants out of this control of Krishna. Or it may just attack. That is the nature of the mind. So first of all, we must understand it. If you don't understand that a tiger is dangerous and it wants to escape, are you going to take precautions? No, you'll just, okay, tiger, you know, you're, good morning, do whatever you like. No, you're very much careful. Little inattentiveness could cause havoc and suffering. We must understand the uncontrolled mind to be our enemy. <clears throat> 